So hi everyone, welcome to our Industry Talks consulting event. We're so happy to have so many wonderful consultants from multiple companies with us today. Um, while people continue to trickle in, we can kind of go around and start with our introductions. So for all of our panelists, uh, I'll just call out each panelist and then if you could please just briefly introduce yourself, your company, what you do, and your um, work in the consulting industry. So uh, we'll start with Alex. Alex, I think you're muted. Did that work? You're muted again, Alex. You know what, and why don't we go to another panelist and Alex, maybe do you want to log out and come back in? Okay, uh, sure. So we'll move on to Patrick. Hi, everyone. Is my audio working? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. Um, my name is Patrick Kane. Uh, I've been a consultant for over 10 years. I'm at KPMG. I work in the healthcare and life sciences group, and I focus on commercial due diligence and growth strategy projects with investment firms and corporations, and excited well, you, to uh, learn from the other now. panelists and hear from uh, you know, the students today. All right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, next, we have Penny. Oh, Penny, I think you're muted. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Thank you. Um, I'm Penny. I graduated from Macaulay, Queens in uh, 2010. I started um, consulting in the financial services industry about a year after graduating. Uh, I worked in a number of different institutions. I launched my own consulting business about four years ago, a company called Thrivos Consulting. We focus exclusively on consulting financial advisors and professionals and financial institutions that serve the end consumer on how to grow and be more efficient. And as of two weeks ago, I launched a new business called Journey Strategic Wealth, which is a financial institution. So done with, done with the consulting as of last week to actually launch a firm that um, previously I had helped to consult. Congrats, Penny. Thank you, Patrick. Congratulations, Penny. Uh, that's wonderful. Okay, uh, Alex, I see that you're back. Um, would you be able to introduce yourself? Can you, can you hear yep, me now? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, so sorry about that, everyone. So Alex Bartigas, um, so I'm a director at EY Parthenon based here in Austin. Um, I've been with T.Y. Parthenon for about five, four years now after graduating from business school from Texas A&M University. Uh, our consulting work focuses primarily on uh, anything transaction related. Um, there's three, three arms of E.Y. Parthenon that exist um, within transactions that are turnaround restructuring arm, uh, which has to do with any sort of restructuring or liquidity issues that a company is going with. Our transaction strategy and execution arm which is the arm that I sit in, which is primarily any sort of uh, transactions that are taking place in the operational side of getting those ready for a successful um, day one, as we call it. Uh, and then the other arm, which is our corporate growth strategy arm, which is uh, working with different companies for uh, any markets that they're going to go look into and the transactions that they're trying to do um, and, and helping them along their way in that journey. Great. Thank you, Alex. And next we have Carolina. Hi, yeah. So my full name is Carolina, but I also go by Caro. So whatever's easier to pronounce. Um, I am a senior business analyst at McKinsey and Company. I've been with McKinsey for the last two and a half years. Um, I was a, I was also, I guess, a summer intern at McKinsey twice. Um, so I've been at McKinsey overall probably almost three years at this point if you count the summer experience. Um, I, as a business analyst, have done work in a variety of different industries. I've done 
worked in healthcare with pharma companies. Um, I've worked with financial institutions, public finance institutions. Um, I've did a, a really cool aerospace and defense project. So I'm truly a, a jack of all trades, master of none, maybe. We'll, <laughs> we'll see, as yet to be determined. Um, and now in my senior year as a senior BA, I'm working uh, internally with our North America recruiting team to help improve uh, diversity and inclusion in our hiring. Process. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we have Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, Mike Temba. I am with uh, Deloitte Consulting. Uh, I've been with Deloitte for about three years. Um, I focus in uh, finance and enterprise performance. Well, what that means is essentially finance transformation projects. Uh, my industry is power and utilities. Uh, prior to Deloitte, spent over 10 years in industry. So um, power and utilities is what I like to do. I really don't want to do anything else. Um, but uh, happy to, to talk to everybody today. Great. Thank you for joining us, Mike. And last but not least, we have Katie. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Thader, and I work for an organization uh, known as Katamba. We're a social impact consulting firm uh, that primarily works in K-12 education. Um, and we, I think, pride ourselves, um, one, on working with really anyone who's trying to do the right thing for kids. Um, and we do uh, some strategy consulting and then also stay on for uh, like early stages of implementation as well. And so uh, really excited to talk with everyone today about uh, the work that we do at Catapa. Okay, thank you, Katie. So these are all of our wonderful panelists today. Thank you once again for joining us. And without further ado, I'll jump right into the questions that we have for today. So kind of going around the table, could each panelist please walk us through a typical day at your job? Because I know we have many different fields here, uh, different specific interests. And could you just walk us through what a typical day looks like? Um, anybody can start. I can go ahead. Um, a lot of this might sound familiar to some others, so I'll, I'll keep it brief. So I start at like 8.30. We work with a team overseas. So the beginning of my day and the end of my day always is working with a team that's 12 hours separated from us. So we start our day working with them. Uh, we'll speak with partners on a project beginning of the day, depending what that project is to make sure we're all aligned on specific tasks and the things that need to get executed as we work backwards from our end goal. Um, usually a, a lot of our work uh, that I do entails primary and secondary research. So what that means is potentially running interviews with experts in different fields, getting a survey set up properly to gather customer feedback, and really focusing a lot on those types of research functions to build PowerPoint slides and Excel models, which we'll then usually use to have some sort of you know client update. That's not as much of a daily thing, but we're always working to those client milestones, whether it's a three-week M&A project or a three-month kind of corporate growth strategy project, but you know, I'll wrap it with every day is a little different, and I'm sure a lot of the other panelists can speak to that as well, depending on the type of engagement, what stage you're in at that engagement. Um, so everything changes a little bit, but uh, we're, we're always moving fast, and the days definitely move quickly, I would say. Oh. The sequence of last uh, question, I guess I'll follow. So every day is definitely different. I'm in a little bit of a different situation, having left the corporate consulting world to, to do my own thing. And so the day is really split, I would say in three. The first would be handling individual client engagements. So a financial advisory firm might hire my team to help them manage profit compression or manage integrating next gen talent on their team, name any, any one of these problems that we have to solve. And so, um, you know, in any given day, we may be working with them for an hour. We usually do calls with our individual teams um, two times a month for one to two hours. And so we may be actively solving problems with them. 
we may be saying to them, hey, you know, we looked at what you sent us and, and here's our suggestions on how you want to powerfully move forward with hiring this person, whatever it may be. So that's one thing. Something that's a little bit unique about my consulting company is it's a combination of technical consulting and behavioral coaching. Um, I feel that um, firms pay consultants a lot of money sometimes to come in and give them a, a plan. And I, I think real consulting comes to life when you understand the people and what drives people to, to act a certain way or what, what causes culture to be created a certain way. So um, we work with individual clients on any given day. We might be working with a bigger institution to do a presentation on GameStop. That's a presentation I did last week about what was going on in the markets. And then the third part of the day is just personal branding for the business. So uh, I'm on YouTube. I run a YouTube series, um, you know, getting the word out there about the type of consulting we do and the way we do the industry. I'll just add on, I think, to kind of what um, Penny was alluding to with um, kind of your day to day. So all of the things that Patrick and Penny mentioned um, hold true. Um, I'd say, you know, as an as a consultant, um, depending on kind of what level you're at or, or the particular firm that you go to, um, business development is generally part of um, the job as well. And, and what that looks like is typically um, supporting proposals um, or pursuits to try to generate more business for the firm. Um, some of these are formalized pursuits where, you know, a company will issue a request for work. You know, we need a new uh, accounting system implemented. Uh, we need a restructuring of our finance organization. Uh, and some of these are informal. They're based on um, relationships uh, that the firm may have with executives um, across industries. And, you know, we just want to get in front of that executive and, and show them a point of view about, you know, how restructuring uh, their organization will uh, allow them to save money or how um, something like uh, automation, robotics process automation, uh, can help them become more efficient. Um, and you may be pulled into um, some of those discussions and some of the well, some of um, support those discussions, and that's in the form of, of building, um, you know, decks or, or uh, pot potentially white papers or anything of that nature to try and um, really kind of uh, attract the client and have them go with your firm and not another. Um, I can go next. Um, I I'll just try to build on um, what everyone has said so far. I think that. Um, in case helpful, what I um, would share about what the day-to-day -day looks like at Katamba is I think different consulting firms have um, structures where maybe you work on one project uh, for three or six months and then you transition to another project. Um, but like for that period of time, you're really focused on, on one client. Um, the way we're set up is you could expect to be on anywhere from three to five projects at any given time. Uh, Essentially, like I think the day to day like is quite similar. You're preparing for client updates. You might be doing research and analysis or building a financial model. Um, but uh, the the you end up kind of working on multiple projects at once. And we try to like make it so that the the length and intensity and start and ends are sort of varied. So that you know when a project is kicking off or wrapping up and it's really intense, you don't have all of your projects doing that at the same time. Um, and then this is uh, obviously we're in the pandemic and, and there's very little business travel happening. I think that one thing um, that might be a little bit different about Katamba is we don't travel on site quite as much as other consulting firms might. And so we you might travel for a big meeting, um, but the actual day to day work um, would be done in one of our offices. I want to talk a little bit about like the analyst experience specifically, since um, I feel like that is still something that I, I remember really well, just starting out at McKinsey and, and what that was like on a day to day basis. Um, it's really intimidating at first because your your day will be made up of a ton of meetings where 
you're going in and talking to clients and they're using jargon that you may not understand. And you're just trying to keep up and, and stay afloat as, as quickly as you possibly can to, to ramp up and, and you know get all of that content knowledge if, if you're in an industry that's really esoteric to you. Um, like my first project was like for a pharmaceutical company. I, I, I did not major in science. I didn't know anything about the pharma industry. Um, so there was a lot of learning that I had to do really quickly. Um, so I would say when you're, you're first starting out, your, your days are gonna feel a bit like a blur and like you're just trying to stay afloat and just trying to understand like what everyone is talking about, um, maybe reading like news articles about your client, reading more about the industry, you know, contacting experts so that you can get up to speed for yourself. Um, and for me, I think what was really helpful and continues to be helpful in the job that I'm in now is having a structure of like check-in and out with your manager. Um, so I, I would often work in a team room with my manager and then maybe one or two other analysts on the team was and at the beginning of the day uh, depending on what time and what team norms we had set for ourselves um, we'd all come in and we'd do a team check-in and we'd talk about all of our priorities for the day and then if there was anything that I felt like I needed my manager's input on like that was the time to raise it and say hey can we grab time this afternoon to like problem solve this a little further um, and then you have a checkout at the end of the day again depending on what your team norms are um, but at the end of the day, you'll talk through what were the priorities you set this morning and what got accomplished, what's maybe delayed, and then is there anything that you need to work on in the evening? So that's kind of the like analyst perspective. Okay, thank you, uh, Caro. And the last, uh, I believe, Alex? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, a lot of it has been has been said kind of what the life of a consultant is. I think um, a couple of things to hit on, especially what Mike was talking about, which is stuff outside of work, which is the business development and then all their other internal initiatives that you might be involved in. So, you know, I've been involved with our diversity and inclusiveness uh, initiatives since I've joined the firm, taking part in some of our initiatives that we have when we go to campus and looking for some of our DNI candidates that we're looking for. Uh, going to various conferences, um, you know, usually going out to National Black uh, MBA every year and recruiting some diverse, you know, our, our candidates that we're looking at. Um, and then other sort of community impact things. You know, I was been involved um, with our college uh, math program, which is a mentorship program that takes place throughout the school year that we're, we're mentoring uh, a school that has juniors and seniors that are preparing to go to school. Um, we meet with them once a month to go over various topics to prepare them, you know, to get ready to go to college, you know, finance, um, resume building, um, etiquette, all those sort of things. Um, working with some of some of these these students from these underprivileged areas and, and hoping to, you know, move them along in their careers and their life. Um, and that's been a big impact for me. Um, especially having that opportunity being in Chicago. Um, you know, it's kind of one of the best things that we would take place in, you know, in the office on a Friday to meet with them, you'd have lunch with them, connect with them, uh, and then still, you know, keeping in contact with some of those students now. So a couple of them now are, you know, in their second, third year of college, you know, they're still reaching out to me and asking me questions and things like that. So it's also other things outside of just the work that you're involved with as well. Um, and then, you know, obviously all the, uh, the work activities that everyone's hit on so far. Hey, thank you, Alex. That's wonderful that students are still uh, in touch with you after the program. So I've noticed that uh, along amongst all of the panelists, there are many different fields within the consulting industry that you're all a part of. And so my question is, what made you decide to enter this industry? And how did you get into the specific consulting field that you're in? And what do you like the most about what you do? Um, and once again, it's open to anyone to start. I can... I'll go first. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, um, I got into the business by accident. I, I, I wanted to go into finance. I was a corporate finance and economics double major. Honestly, doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, I haven't really used a whole lot of it. Um, to, uh, maybe that's not appropriate for here, but um, also went to the London School of Economics while I was studying at Macaulay. But again, 
doesn't translate when you start a job in finance. Um, I started out in sales. Um, I was uh, speaking at um, a, a CUNY event actually, and a gentleman approached me and he happened to sit on, no, he was the CEO at the time of New York Life, the insurance company. And um, he obviously got me an interview and I started in sales, wholesaling mutual funds to financial advisors. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was an interesting way to start in the business. Um, but I, I quickly said, I don't, I don't think this is going to be for me long term. Um, I want to do something that requires more critical thinking and problem solving skills. So um, it, there was a project at the time, um, a consulting project, they were looking for somebody honestly young and willing to travel a whole lot. And, um, I, you know, they tapped me for a project which started my career in, in what's considered practice management consulting. So helping financial advisors and institutions optimize their practices. Um, I loved it because it combined a bunch of skills. And this is really important for anybody who is interested in consulting and finance, but isn't analytics and, and technical competencies. It maybe is not your strong suit. For me, it always was communication and presenting. And so um, what I enjoyed about it was that, was connecting with people, was speaking on stage, hosting workshops and facilitating, um, facilitating workshops. And um, it, you, you just, you have to know what you're uh, really good at. And in the consulting world, there's so many different roles and opportunities. Um, you know, finding people who can help you find that right role is what works for me. And that's what I love about it, candidly, is just getting to know people and, and seeing how what we do helps change their businesses and in turn their lives. And that's what's really nice about being a boutique practice versus, you know, a really big, big firm. Okay, thank you, Penny. Uh, does any other panelists want to go next? Yeah, I can go next, Anne. So I think um, what kind of brought me to consulting, I really didn't know much about consulting until I got to business school and really um, had the opportunity to meet some different consulting firms while at school. Um, and what kind of brought me to the table was a couple of things. Um, basically, the amount of knowledge that you're able to learn uh, and working on different industries and different clients and working with different people you know, that was something that kind of really interests me in, in being able to learn a lot of information in a short period of time. And then two, um, I had come from a, a sports background and the opportunity within some of these consulting firms, you know, that everyone here is on, that you're working on a team and that everyone is working on their part of the project together, you know, moving towards that goal. And so um, the opportunity to work with high, you know, high caliber individuals who are very smart while also working on a team um, and allowing yourself to grow professionally was was kind of important to me. And, and I saw that in consulting was the way uh, that I was able to do that. Um, in the MA space, really, I just so happened to have my internship um, was working on uh, an MA deal and just had the opportunity to understand and learn more about um, the life cycle of how a business acquires another company and how, you know, there's certain things that happen behind the scenes that we're not aware of as, you know, consumers, you know, when another company buys another company, there's certain things that need to take place in order for things to continue smoothly so that there's no business operations, um, you know, impact to the customer. And so to me, it was all that work behind the scenes and understanding all the work that goes into it, um, you know, and how it's was complex and interesting and, you know, the intensity sometimes of that. Um, you know, it was that environment that really drove me to, to move back towards M&A after leaving school. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, can one of our other panelists speak on the subject matter a bit? Sure, um, I'm happy to go. Um, I came into consulting after working in public education for a number of years. Um, and so prior to joining Katamba, I um, was a director of operations at a charter school in Brooklyn. Um, I think that what drew me to consulting, and I think Katamba specifically, was the opportunity to have like a, a wider impact. And so the 
the work that we do potentially like could impact school districts or whole schools. And um, that was that was really appealing to me. I think on like a very education specific level, the mission of working with anyone who's trying to do the right thing for kids really me. I think that uh, education can be a really political issue uh, and the idea that we're kind of willing to work with anyone who who has children's interests um, at the center of their work um, uh, was exciting to me um, and then I think just to echo what um, I think Alex you said like I love the people that I work with I think consulting tends to attract um, people who like to move really quickly who are interested in problem solving who um, also like really want to deliver a, a superior um, product or service to their client. Um, I love working at um, an organization where I feel like um, I'm being challenged by the people that I work with every day too. Thank you, Katie. Uh, we have a few more panelists. Yeah, I can jump in. Something Katie said there about the people we work with is it rang so true to me, especially working on teams, right? I knew that I wanted to work with other smart people to constructively solve problems. And obviously you'll get tasks that will put you into your own lane sometimes, but you're always pushing each other and you're collabor collaboratively being competitive. Um, I think another thing that's small like consultants is I totally stumbled into it. I was in sales. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I studied for the LSAT. I was like, never mind. Um, and it was like early 2010 and I needed a job and I didn't know what to do. So I literally started in the mailroom at another consulting firm and I just harassed enough people until I got hired. Um, so I kind of stumbled into it. And another thing that I think uh, Carolina highlighted that was really helpful for me was I was a total generalist doing M&A work. So I got exposed to a lot of different things. And I think that's really cool when you first start out um, because that allowed me over like eight years to figure out that like healthcare and a particular type of life sciences with pharma and medical devices was really interesting to me. Um, and I'm like the least tech savvy person ever. So I knew like B2B software would probably not be a great fit for me. Compared to some other panelists we have who do tech transformation. Um, so I think it's really just a mentality of like wanting to push yourself and work hard, working with smart people and being open to lots of different things. I think that makes like a great consulting candidate. And I think that's what a lot of firms look for is someone just excited to work with other people and willing to learn. Um, so one thing I always think about too is there's this imposter syndrome, right? Where we all think like, oh my God, like I'm the person in the room that doesn't know anything. Everyone in the room thinks that, right? Even the partners have that feeling that's just like being human. So I totally, every firm I've started at, I'm like, oh shit, like I'm the dumb guy. Um, that's a good thing, right? Because it means you're going to learn from other smart people. And then you slowly learn that, oh, I, I do know a little bit more than I thought. And you can kind of push yourself accordingly. Okay, thank you, Patrick. That was really um, enlightening. Uh, we have two more panelists, Mike and Carol. Yeah, so... Um... I, uh, I came into consulting as an experienced hire. Um, I, was, uh, I was in power and utilities for, for over 10 years, as I mentioned, and I was um, a director of finance operations. And um, I knew that, you know, I had wanted to spend my time in power and utilities, but I knew I wanted to do different things within the industry. So kind of piggybacking on kind of the theme here is consulting is a place where you can explore different industries. You can also explore different parts of an industry um, or just different companies. Every company is different, even from a utility standpoint. The, the challenges of a utility on the West Coast uh, are very different from the challenges of a utility in the Northeast. Um, and so I knew that I wanted that kind of dynamic uh, environment um, as well as um, when it comes to the people. You know, consulting is like, it's sometimes it's like starting a new job every few months, you know, new people, new work. And that, that really 
excites me. Um, and so I think if you're the type of person that, you know, enjoys meeting new people, enjoys new challenges, um, different clients, different culture environments, you know, from, from the workplaces that you'll be in, um, I think that, you know, it's a really good, good career. And, um, and but some of the relationships that you make too are, are last, you know, forever. So, um, you know, so far so good for me. Yeah, I definitely feel like everything that's been said really resonates with me. Um, speaking personally, I had done an internship with a nonprofit organization before I even thought about doing consulting. Um, and as part of that internship, I helped them develop a business plan for how to achieve their goals. And I really enjoyed that experience, but I felt like the organization that I was working with didn't actually have the resources in place to meet their goals and maybe didn't even have the capabilities in place to meet those goals. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, I wanted to find an opportunity that would allow me to actually be in a space that I was having impact. And I felt like not only was I well supported, but I was helping other people achieve their goals with the right capabilities and resources. Um, I think Katie mentioned the idea of having impact on a broader scale. That was something that really drew me to consulting. And then also the notion of jumping from project to project. I feel like I'm the type of person that could get bored very easily if I was always doing the same task day in and day out. And I really felt like having variety in the kind of work that I'm doing was really important, which explains also why I wanted to be very much a generalist and never committed to a specific industry. Um, I just love the, the feeling of always learning something new, like every couple of months, having to like challenge yourself to ramp up to speed. Like I, I find that really invigorating. Okay, thank you, Caro. And uh, thank you for all of our panelists for all the different insights to your specific field. Uh, before we move out to breakout rooms, I'd like to go through a few individualized questions for each of the panelists. So I'll start with Alex. Um, I noticed that within your career, you have worked on one of the biggest advanced manufacturing deals in history uh, by helping a client stand up on their own and as a new independent company. Could you possibly talk to us more about this deal and your experience along with the role you served during this process? Yeah, so uh, so this, I know we got a little bit of time here left, but uh, essentially we had 200 year old companies that were coming together, you know, as, as a partnership and splitting apart into three. And so, you know, our role was helping our clients essentially understand what their new organization was going to look like after that split. And so, um, super complex organization because you've got, you know, two organizations that have been around for, you know, 100 plus years, you know, operating in capacity all across the world with different supply chains and different IT systems and things like that. And so, um, just kind of getting things, you know, uh, on, on paper, understanding the process, you know, was, uh, you know, a super um, you know, intricate, you know, thing that we were working on with the client. I mean, the deal took, you know, three plus years to be complete. And so, um, so again, working with, you know, really highly capable people within the organization for them to understand, like, what are, what is the future of this organization going to look like? You know, my role specifically within that, um, within the company and client that I was working for was helping one of their business units who was uh, receiving different parts of other companies as a result of this deal um, and understanding what their new organization was going to look like within the overall big companies. So, you know, their organizational commercial structure and how they went and, and sold their products was going to change, um, how the organization was going to be, you know, organized with people and how they reported up. They received like a new, you know, part of their organization that um, introduced them into the market that they had never been in before, how that was going to be organized. So it kind of went across, you know, bringing all those facets together um, into working, working toward that one goal into being a new business unit and being successful um, was kind of the, the way that we went about it. And then, you know, obviously just a, a whole bunch of myriad of things going on at the same time as you know, different things in the market and, and all those other things that are taking place, um, you know, it, takes, it makes things super complex. But again, you know, you have a big team you work with, you know, you build a client rapport. And our client was, uh, she was awesome. She 
just really um, led her team, you know, when we needed to get things done, you know, very successfully. And so it made working with her, you know, and that and that client uh, and the project really enjoyable. Okay, thank you, Alex. That's a really amazing um, experience that you have there. Next, we have for Patrick, uh, I noticed how you currently focus on health sciences at KPMG, but you had majored in history at Vanderbilt. So could you walk us through, I know you mentioned you started at the mailroom, but kind of how you made the transition from a history major into working on health sciences and consulting? Yeah, um, it's an interesting story. I literally took geology in college. So if you're ever afraid that you don't have the technical chops to get somewhere, um, there's learning doesn't end when you graduate. Um, so what really helped me branch in was the consulting firm I was at prior to KPMG was a boutique consulting firm that does what's called commercial due diligence. It's uh, an aspect of a merger and acquisition process where an investment firm or a corporation that's looking to buy a potential company will ask a consulting firm to produce a study that objectively assesses the business and the market market that it's in to effectively say, you know, is this market attractive and is this potential company that we're going to buy positioned well within this market? Um, one of the cool things about this type of work and similar to a theme you've been hearing a lot is it lends itself to being a generalist when you're first starting out. So they put me on everything from materials for biotechnology processes in life sciences to a manufacturer of commercial grade windows. So every month I'm getting thrown a completely new topic and they very much are encouraging you to understand which industries are most interesting. Uh, because really is to develop functional consulting skills that are applicable to lots of different projects and lots of different industries. And as you advance in your career, and some folks do it earlier where they're like, I know I'm interested in a certain industry. I kind of had no idea. Um, it was easier for me to figure out what I didn't like versus what I did like. Um, but when you build the right skills that a lot of consulting firms, you know, a number of them, you know, my fellow panelists here included, uh, will equip you with that then gives you the ability to say this industry really interests me and you're able to narrow your focus accordingly um i had an open conversation with my partner that i was a history major and i'm really interested in healthcare and life sciences and it was very much just i needed to constantly learn and i think one of the themes a lot of other folks have talked about is you need to be naturally curious to succeed in consulting, I think. Like you want to, you need to want to learn about whatever topic it is. And thankfully, the healthcare and life sciences space was one that just naturally interests me. So every project that starts, I'm on YouTube, I'm reading, I'm trying to consume as much as I can. Um, and I'm asking simple questions with the understanding that I will probably never become an expert. But it's those functional consulting skills that can allow you to move into a lot of different industries. Thank you, Patrick. That's comforting for a lot of us knowing that you don't necessarily need to know exactly what you want to get into to work in that field. Totally. Um, next, <laughs> thank you. We have Penny. So I noticed that you mentioned that you have a real talk approach to consulting. Could you elaborate on what your real talk approach is and how you use it within you know, your day to day job? Yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's become my brand. Um, you know, I think the financial services industry it is, it's, it's an interesting industry to be in. I never quite felt like I belonged in corporate culture and, and consulting in-house at some of the firms I consulted in before launching my own business, in part because, and, and this the consultants will understand this, it's a lot of, you know, meetings to have meetings and a lot of, you know, people in a room. Yeah, I mean, Patrick, I think you talked about, you know, 
your own posture. And you also have the opposite where you have leaders who think they're brilliant and they're really not. And so it, there's just so much of the smoke and mirrors and red shiny objects. And so for me, my, my brand in speaking and I'm a, a, a speaker, so I get paid to talk across the industry, um, which is a whole other field for anyone who's interested in that. But it just became being really honest and um, direct with the end client, for me, that is the financial advisor and financial institution. And saying the things that number one, sometimes they don't wanna hear, or number two, getting to the heart of the issue. The one thing I've seen the past 12 years or so work, working in this business is that firms will, I sometimes call them slow learners with cash. They'll keep paying consultants to tell them the same thing without fundamentally changing what's wrong with the company. And so, um, you know, one example is, wanting to attract more women into the financial services business and doing all these initiatives and putting on these workshops. And, and it's like, well, if you don't treat women poorly in your company, then more women will come work here. And it's sort of really simple. So my approach to consulting always is, and, and people hire us because we're very candid and very genuine. And, you know, we, we do lead, lead with compassion but we will be honest about what we see and hear and what we believe. Um, that happened by accident. I was very vocal about things that I saw wrong in the companies that I worked for. Um, I ultimately left those companies because you're not really supposed to talk like that. But I did find a place for myself in the independent consulting world where it, for some people, it's a breath of fresh air. And, and you know, hearing from the same sort of leaders who all look and sound the same. And then to have somebody come and say, look, we can talk through the problems and talk through the solutions we've built, you know, but let's actually talk about what you're fundamentally not willing to change. And that's why you're always gonna have these problems. So I sort of built my brand that way. And I started, some um, of consulting is business development. You have to land clients and you have to build a name for yourself. I started recording 10 minute videos on a service called BombBomb, B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B. Um, and it's a, a video service that links to your email. So instead of sending a prospect or somebody an email, I'd record a video and people really like that. And so I started recording videos and sending them out to people. And now we have like 3000 subscribers, um, not a tremendous amount, but for this small niche, it's a lot. And and we spend 10 minutes a week talking real talk about what's going on. So, you know, they heard an earful last week about GameStop and Reddit and, you know, um, at the height of the pandemic, talking about working from home and, you know, how much it sucks. Like people glamorize consulting and they glamorize finance and it's, it's really hard work. And a lot of times you just, you're taking punches all day from, from all angles. So it's worked for me and it may not work for everybody. Thank you, Penny. That's really amazing how you really tell people the candid truth. And I'm sure being from a lot of us from New York City, oftentimes that's not something we get to see a lot. So that is really amazing. Uh, next, we have Caro. So um, I noticed that your client work has spanned a variety of industries. And you mentioned how you're generalist because you get bored very easily. Could you tell us about how you manage to balance such diverse industries and what it's like working amongst so many different fields? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's the, the part of it that I've kind of talked about is how exciting for me personally it is to just get up to speed and learn new things every month or so or however often I'm changing projects. Um, and I also really love learning from different leaders that I've worked with because everybody that I've worked with has had a very different and unique leadership style that works for them and is authentic to them. Um, and I feel like that's kind of made me pick and choose like, oh, what are things that I want to incorporate into my own leadership style when I am eventually running teams and things like that. Um, I would say that the, the other part of it is that the, the more projects that you do, I feel like you start to realize that there's a set number of like problems that you'll often encounter. And yes, like every project is different, but you do start to recognize some patterns, um, particularly in my case, I don't have an industry specialty, but I do think I took on a lot of projects that were in what we call the org space. So anything having to do with like the people side of a business, um, like running training programs, uh, hiring, diversity and inclusion, like th that's the work that really feels fulfilling to me. Um, 
and you start to see a lot of common problems across very different industries. And so you do start to learn about like what are what are the challenges that businesses are facing all over the world today because of you know the economic situation that we're in. Um, and I think that is very helpful. It's like a helpful skill to have and develop is that pattern recognition when you're doing like a ton of different industries uh, in a given year. To me, that that's really helped balance it out. That's wonderful. And I'm sure that's also very reassuring for people who are interested in many different fields. Uh, next, we have Mike. So I noticed that you've led large scale finance transformation programs. Could you tell us more about these programs and your roles in the project? Um, sure. Um, generally, with um, finance transformation, um, you're usually tackling kind of multiple facets of um, within an organization. So bringing kind of people, process, and technology and making changes around all those three different areas. Um, sometimes uh, companies are forced to do it. Um, in this particular case, um, one that I'm thinking of, they were forced to do it because they um, had received uh, kind of the worst grade or marking that you could get from uh, an audit, which is a material weakness. Um, and this company, a utility, uh, wanted to continue to do more mergers and acquisitions. They were accumulating utilities along the Northeast. So in order for them to do that, they had to go through this finance transformation uh, to lift this material weakness and, and continue with acquisition. So I led a team in the finance area um, with uh, restructuring um, the finance organization's people. Um, essentially, everyone in a particular group uh, where there were multiple kind of challenges that were going on. Any, everyone in this particular group had to unfortunately reapply for their job um, because we had a, um, an op model uh, restructuring that we were going through there. Um, so that was, that was one piece of it and probably one of the challenging parts of being a consultant. Um, fortunately, most of the folks were able to retain their jobs or move to other organizations um, within the, the company. Uh, the other piece was uh, we were rolling out a large um, uh, accounting and finance system, ERP system, um, that was going to help automate a lot of the processes in the finance organization. Um, so that's kind of the technology piece of it. Um, and then kind of around all of those areas was process, right? We wanted to um, uh, optimize all the processes within the finance space. Essentially, I think Alex alluded to it. First, we had to understand what they do today from a process standpoint. And then kind of um, the best in pra class practices, which you know our firm has gained over the years of doing this hundreds of times and say, okay, from a process standpoint, you're here, you wanna to get to here, best in class. What are some of the steps that you need to take to do that? Um, and so I led uh, those three kind of areas within finance to ultimately transform the finance operations group, um, get the material weakness lifted so that they could continue to um, uh, go through M&A activities. Um, so that's, that's it kind of at a high level in a nutshell. Well, thank you, Mike. That's, uh, that's really interesting that, you know, the whole company actually had so many of its employees had to reapply, but I'm glad to hear a lot of them were able to keep their jobs and ultimately your project was very successful. And uh, for our last question, before you move out to breakout rooms, Katie, I noticed that your background consists of working with children in education and you started in Chicago. And you mentioned that you transitioned from Chicago Public Schools to international operations at Katamba. Could you share with us your experience working within different areas of the US and you know, the different school systems, maybe from even just between you know, Chicago and New York? Yeah, I think that um, I think that what I uh, would say is, and, and kind of builds on um, what Carolina and I think others have said is. Like there is some um, there is some pattern recognition of you know when you work in different geographies or different cities that um, they are sometimes like trying to do similar work or facing similar challenges. I think that one thing that 
has been important is that even when that's true, like every context is different. And so what might work in New York, you know, might not actually work in Chicago um, for a number of different reasons. And I think that um, it's sort of balancing, like having experience and, and knowing what might work, but also really um, when we go in and work with a client, like really trying to value and respect the wisdom in the room. I think um, in a lot of industries, I think um, in education being one of them, like you go into a room and someone has worked for the school district for 20 or 25 years and has seen a lot. And so I think it's really important to go in with an open mindset of, you know, downloading all the information and really taking to heart uh, the experiences that they've had to inform what might be the solution in that given context. Um, I think that uh, we never, and I think this goes like with all consulting firms, you never kind of want to go in and be like, we know everything and this is exactly what you should do. And so it's really important to take all the steps to understand, ask the questions to understand your clients and the um, specific um, nuances to, to their situation um, in order to serve them best. Yes, thank you, Katie. I'm sure nobody really likes it when you've been there for a long time and somebody comes in and tries to tell you otherwise. So uh, we have, um, we're actually going to start and move into our breakout rooms. Um, but before we do, uh, I wanted to just remind everyone that the in the breakout rooms, this is the time for you to ask each of our panelists uh, any specific questions you have about their own career trajectories, their backgrounds. And we encourage you to turn on your camera so that there's more of a one-on-one -on -one in person feel, but of course you can do it as whatever's comfortable. But uh, we're going to have about 10 minutes with each panelist. So Harleen is going to help us move around into the rooms. Nobody else actually needs to move or do anything. So we're going to uh, go ahead and get started. <laughs> 